Next item, I believe, is item 30, which is on page five. It's under the fire department. It's a presentation on electrical utilities, public safety power, the public safety sh power shutoff program to de-energize electrical power to protect public safety during increased risk of fire. Morning, Chief. Good morning, Honorable Chairman and Honorable Board of Supervisors. David Witt, Fire Chief and Director of Emergency Services on behalf of Emergency Services. Today, I'll give a short presentation on public service power shutoffs, and behind me, we have the different directors that would play a role in the power shutoffs, as well as Pacific Gas and Electric and uh, Southern California Edison uh, sitting behind me. So I'll give my presentation, and then I'll open it up to questions, if I could, um, with questions to PG&E and Southern California Edison. Okay, public safety power shutoffs. Uh, per California Public Utilities Code 451 and 399, investor-owned electric utilities are allowed to de-energize electrical power to protect public safety. In 2018, the California Public Utilities Commission adopted resolution which strengthens customer and local government notification requirements before de-energization. To meet the requirements, electric utility companies have developed a de-energization de-energization protocol, referred to as a public safety power shutoff, as a prevalent measure of last resort in the utility, if the utility company reasonably believes there is an imminent and significant uh, risk, then they can shut off the power. So uh, they do this based on weather conditions, um, you know, oftentimes in, the, in fire service, we look at things like uh, relative humidity, geography, um, where this is in the landscape, history, um, the, the, the relevance of whether there's going to be a big fire, and oftentimes we refer to red flag conditions. Um, they divide it up into tier two, which is elevated, and tier three, which is extreme. And you can see on this map here, the, the yellow would be the uh, tier two, and orange would be tier three, or red. Um, so far to date, obviously, we've had uh, multiple messages in various areas uh, around Lake Isabella, as, where, as well as the Bear Valley, Tehachapi area. They will notify customers 48 hours prior and 24 hours prior. They'll notify local government 72 hours prior. We've set up a system, uh, Georgiana Armstrong has set up a system to notify people. Uh, all of us get email notifications of where we're at in the process. Uh, deactivation could occur at any time, day or night, dependent upon um, the uh, Southern California Edison and PG&E. And I, and I want to state, I should have said this in the beginning, this is not a Kern County Fire Department program. This is not um, a Kern County Fire Department program. We are reactionary to PG&E and SCE. Um, but this is uh, not our program. We're reacting to it. So Pacific Gas and Electric, uh, mainly San Joaquin Valley, so uh, through the Bakersfield area, tier two and tier three areas. And uh, Southern California Edison um, uh, would be other areas, mainly Lake Isabella area. Uh, deactivation could be a small area. It could be as small as Bodfish, or it could be as big as all of Lake Isabella and the Tatchby area and um, on up the, the uh, transmission line. Uh, so what are the impacts? Uh, our team has looked at, uh, you know, seven hospitals in PG&E's territory, two hospitals in SCE's territory, and how long they can operate without electricity, with backup generators. Schools are affected. Schools could be closed. Potable water can be affected. Uh, those that have the, the bigger companies, like Cal Water, wouldn't be as affected as much as those that have water wells if they don't have solar power. So a lot of people up at the Lake Isabella area or more rural areas would be affected more than um, some of the bigger areas, wastewater. We have generators for five days of operations. Public works can pump the ponds 
and we feel a resistance for seven days without interruptions. Fire suppression, we wouldn't have uh, fire hydrants that would uh, be pressurized. We have other sources that we can use for water. However, it would be an obstacle. Hazardous materials facilities. Um, you know, uh, the powers to be are constantly talking to uh, hazardous materials facilities and working with them, but they have a lot of built-in um, fail-safe programs to assist in this. The continuity of operations, we have alerts and warnings. Once again, though, it's uh, the utility companies who will notify are responsible and have to notify uh, our constituents that there is a power outage. However, uh, we have uh, warning systems that we would uh, activate in certain circumstances as well. We have cooling centers, six county-owned operated cooling centers, uh, obviously concerned about the old and the young. Uh, the senior center at Lake Isabella has an on-site generator and uh, we're making plans for uh, generators to be put in other locations to uh, have cooling centers. We know when there's high fire danger, it's obviously very hot outside. And so that's a concern. Fuel, fuel, how do we get to where we're going? Uh, 16 road yard maintenance facilities have gas and diesel. However, only three sites have backup generators. Supports for roads, fire, and sheriff's department are their top priority. There'll be no regional transit um, disruption is anticipated. Um, one area that I think we need to look at as a whole, regardless of this power outage, uh, we need to look at our generators and, and our backup power. And we have 69 generators on site. However, uh, 29 of these wouldn't operate everything. So at a lot of our fire stations, uh, we wouldn't be able to operate the fuel and the doors and uh, the dispatch equipment on the inside, but we're working on that and we're, we've got a grant application in for that. Um, no power, no backup power to the coroner's office. And we're uh, coming up with uh, additional plans. So public safety power shutoff notification. We have an email group set up that notifies everybody. We have a GIS working group that is gonna be working together to uh, produce maps to, so we know the areas. It's been an ongoing thing though. It's been an ongoing every day. There's been a threat of power shutoffs. So as you can see, we have a wide variety of participants who all are gonna play a role in the public safety power outages by the utilities company. Aging and Adult Services, Behavior Health and Recovery, County, the CAO's office, County Council, EMS with the hospitals and the old and the young, environmental health with uh, hazardous materials and a whole slew of other items, fire department, general services, human services, our computer systems, public works, sheriffs, and then the other uh, stakeholders, OES, uh, the superintendent of schools and superior courts if there was an issue. Public awareness, this is so important, whether it's a power shut off or it's an earthquake. Somehow the power shut off. We are gonna step up our game on education, on how we prepare ourselves uh, through our social media for um, life without power, water, fuel, and how we prepare ourselves. And so we're actively uh, ramping up in that area. Um, through the CAO's office as well as through the fire department and other venues. And go to ready.gov for more tips and information. And so with that, that's the general gist of public safety power shutoffs. But I know there'll be uh, questions that uh, for PG&E and Southern California Edison, and so I would like to uh, take this opportunity to invite them up to um, talk a little bit and present on the items that I may have missed, and I'll be right here. Thank you. Is there anyone here today from pg &E or Southern California? Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and board members. I'm Brian Thoburn, Government Relations Manager. I'm standing in this morning for my colleague, Cal Rossi. Um, and then I also want to introduce uh, Tom Jacobus, who's our Principal Manager for Business Resiliency. So I think at this point, I may want to just turn it over to Tom for some comments on our, our program. I'm sorry, could you spell your last name for us? Sure, my last name is Thoburn, T as in Tom, H-O, B as in boy, U-R-N as in Nancy. Thank you. Thank you. 
morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Tom Jacobus from Southern California Edison. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today uh, to address any questions you may have. Uh, I understand the, the county's been whipsawed uh, in the last, last week or so. Um, the, the conditions that we look at, uh, as the chief mentioned, we, we look at fuel conditions, uh, live fuel moisture, dead fuel moisture, um, and, it, and make an assessment. Uh, that's, one, that's one tier. Uh, that we look at are one set of criteria. The other criteria that we look at are the wind speeds. And it's not necessarily that the winds are so high, but we've got about 1,300 circuits. About a third of our infrastructure falls within tier two or tier three uh, high fire risk areas as identified by the Public Utility Commission map uh, that was put together. So we look at uh, fuel conditions and we look at wind speeds. And in particular, the wind speeds at which our various circuits, which we've got about 1,300 of them, that not within the county, but all in uh, distribution circuits that fall within high fire risk areas, uh, at what point do they begin to experience problems uh, such as outages? And then from that, we determine what the wind speeds are. So we've been in this uh, sort of do loop uh, in Kern County. Uh, we are working with CAL FIRE. Um, the chief of CAL FIRE, uh, Southern California Edison has hired a, a fire fuels expert, which the chief knows and everybody in the fire community knows, to uh, work together, not just with uh, SCE in the public sector, but to work with uh, also PG&E and San Diego Gas and Electric, so that we get all, all, so that we're all on the same page in terms of what conditions that we're looking at and what really defines uh, the risk because we are seeing elevated fuel conditions. Uh, it's not extreme. We also haven't de-energized any circuits uh, at this point, because the other thing that we look for is, um, you know, we make a determination of whether we're gonna start to notify based on these fuel conditions, if we see elevated fuel conditions, if we see the wind speeds at the speeds that we're looking for for the particular circuits, that triggers us to, to begin our notifications at 72 hours. Uh, from when we're expecting the weather, we'll reach out to the to the county, uh, to the elected officials, to let them know that we're considering this. Uh, then, when it gets down to the day that we're expecting the weather, we have qualified electrical workers out in the field uh, that have local knowledge, that have worked, you know, in these communities for a long time, really looking eyes on the ground to see, hey, are they seeing the wind speeds or the conditions that we're that our models are showing. Uh, if they do see unsafe conditions in the field, they will call us back at our emergency operations center and we'll make a decision to de-energize. Uh, and the three events that we had uh, last year, <clears throat> I think we de-energized three lines total in our whole service territory. It impacted about 148 customers total uh, in the three events and we were able to to minimize the impact because our lines have uh, isolation points where we're able to pinch down the uh, impacted area and still leave you know, most of the areas energized where we're not seeing uh, unsafe conditions. Uh, public safety power shutoff isn't the only thing we do. Um, it is our method of uh, last resort. We also change the way that we operate our electric system when we see these elevated conditions. We have devices on our uh, electric system called reclosers, which just like the name implies, it's like a circuit breaker. Uh, if there's a fault on the line, uh, line pops open, interrupts the flow of power, the recloser then does just what the name implies, recloses, sends a test bolt of electricity down the line. Uh, if it tests good, the line stays closed. If it tests bad, it pops open again. So during, during these higher risk times, we'll block that reclosing feature so that hey, if we did have a palm frond laying across a line or a tree blew into the line or a trampoline or an easy up, um, once that line pops open, it will stay open. Uh, it will not reclose because hey, if it didn't start a fire on the first fault, we don't want to give it another shot. Uh, we've also got fast curve settings enabled, which uh, reduces the amount of uh, energy that's expelled when these lines do fault. Uh, again, if it's limiting the, the time that the fault is occurring, uh, it's tripping it that much faster. 
Uh, so those are things that we do ahead of time. We're also spending you know, millions of dollars to harden our systems. Uh, unfortunately, you know, those investments, aren't, it, it takes a lot of time uh, to upgrade uh, 1,300 circuits with uh, insulated conductor and fire-resistant poles, and it's going to take about five years. So we filed a, a wildfire mitigation plan that has uh, metrics in it that we're held to um, by the Public Utility Commission and, and others. And the, the estimate right now is it's going to take about five years uh, to get those upgrades in place, which will reduce uh, the need for a pu potential public safety power shutoff. It'll, it will reduce the likelihood. But um, here's where we're at right now. So I'll open it up to questions or if you want to hear from PG&E. Uh, what's the board's pleasure? I'll tell you what, we'll hear from pg &E, then we'll sure. Thanks. ask anybody. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you very much. Good morning, Chairman and Supervisors. I'm Kristen Dowd, Local Public Affairs Representative for Kern County, and I have with me my colleague Jeff Kessley, who's the Public Safety Specialist. Um, I guess really don't have much to add. The, the chief did a great job presenting the program as well as Edison expanding on, on the program. It is a statewide program um, that all the investor-owned utilities are, are rolling out, um, and it really is for the safety of our customers and the communities that we serve, um, but happy to answer any questions that, that you may have. Thank you. I have a couple. Um, I'd like to see, I know you showed us I think maybe that was the chief that showed us a map of Kern County. Mm -hmm. Maybe it went as far as the coast. I don't. I don't recall how. I think the, it's just uh, Kern County. Could could we see the map? Uh, a, a not right now. I recognize you probably don't have that, but a map of the state, yeah. who all is impacted eventually. I'd like to see that. Um, and I'll just ask the question that I think is lingering. Isn't is this a reaction to some action taken by the legislature? that really sort of put the onus upon the public, publicly owned utilities? Had there not been an action taken by the legislature, you probably wouldn't be doing this. I'm well, not trying to put you in a difficult spot, well, but isn't that, well, isn't that where we're at? Well, as, as we've looked at the fires, you know, 10 of the, the 20 most destructive fires uh, in the, have happened in the last five years. So we're coming off five years of drought. Um, we've got the governor and Cal OES calling this the new normal in terms of um, urban interface. And you know we've got these destructive fires that are occurring, only 10% of which uh, approximately are utility caused. Um, as a company, uh, we're looking at it saying we, we cannot we cannot be in a position where we're part of the problem uh, of, or, or in the position where we're burning down a neighborhood where our lines are causing you know, catastrophic fires. So we're having to upgrade our infrastructure and, and, and do all this work uh, because I think we recognize we're gonna continue to grow uh, as a state and we're, and we're gonna continue to build uh, in these wildland urban interface areas uh, in these high fire risk areas, so we've got to take, we've got to take action. I'm not sure that answered my question. Okay. <laughs> the question was, was there, uh, and maybe it was legal action. I, I don't recall. So we've been, so we've been. But I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm sure, just trying so, to get. So we've, you know, the, we've been doing this, uh, or we've had this authority for a long time. We actually did do a de-energization in 2003. Um, you know, in the Arrowhead area when there was uh, a significant fire going on and we actually de-energized circuits there. So I think, you know, regardless of legislative action or any, of other, any other kind of action, uh, both our company and I don't want to speak for PG&E, but I guess I am, uh, would be doing the same thing. I don't regardless. want to put you, let me ask our CAO, because I, I understand the position you're in. Is there, or our county council, was there recent legislative action, or was there a recent court case? Did the liability shift from, or was more liability placed on the publicly owned utilities within the last, since, since some of these fires that have occurred that 
makes the publicly owned utilities even contemplate this action. Um, there was some there. legislative activity, uh, primarily at this time though, it's a, li a serious liability concern for the electrical utilities. The only utilities required to comply with these requirements are investor held. Investor owned, okay. And can you briefly describe what the legislative activity or the legislative action was? I'm not terribly familiar with it. It was simply imposed after the campfire issues. I, I'd be interested in knowing that when you get a chance, if you could research that for us. I'll Thank be you. happy to. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Supervisor Maggard. Thank you. Uh, Chief, could you run through one time, uh, one more time for us those uh, consequences or threats that these proposed uh, de-energizations will have on public safety infrastructure? So the, so the threats or the impacts are wide a range, wide variety of aspects. We could look um, from a fire standpoint and we could look at fire stations being able to, to operate without backup power. Um, or we could look at um, a wide variety of infrastructure, whether it be EMS related, whether it be hospitals, water, uh, sewer. Um, but our team of directors have put together a plan to address each one of these issues. Um, it's been an ongoing effort every day now for the last week. Um, there are uh, areas specifically that we need to look at as a county as a whole, and that's generators, generator power. Uh, for the fire department, we've applied for a grant, for a million dollar grant, to uh, put more generators at fire stations. And so there's a wide variety, fuel, water, um, a lot of big ticket items, old, young, and heat. There's a lot of impacts that uh, we could have and that we're trying to mitigate. So the, the one that caught my ear the first time you went through this was the issue of uh, whether or not fire hydrants might, might or might not work. Explain to us why a fire, it, it, did I understand that correctly, and why would a fire hydrant not work? So with the uh, electrical uh, capabilities of pumping, um, you know, there's a pressure involved with the fire hydrants. Um, one aspect, though, I reached out to Southern California Edison and, and talked with a, a cohort of mine, uh, Troy Whitman, and I believe that um, given certain circumstances, they would uh, energize the power back on because um, we may need the hydrants to effectively most effectively uh, fight a fire. We have other ways to get water. In some cases, could be drafting, could be um, uh, engines that specifically have water, called water tenders, that carry water from one site to another. Very uh, limited quantities of water compared to fire hydrants, though, right? Yes, sir. So uh, who was your cohort, you said, in, in another organization, and, and what organization was he with? Uh, Troy Whitman is in charge of, I believe, fire operations. Fire management. Fire management for Southern California Edison. Where is he? Okay. And he, he's, um, we've had conversations about um, in the event of a fire and uh, our fire department needing more water. <clears throat> it's uh, uh, surprising to me that apparently the utilities have had this authority since 2003, if I understood uh, Mr. Jacoby correctly. Uh, so it, it isn't like we haven't had some time to think about what the consequences are, but I would like us to think about such consequences as uh, would a power outage at the absolute worst possible time affect the ability of the dam to be effective at Lake Isabella? You know, the, the, whatever those horrific consequences might be, worst case scenarios would be. So who's running those out and when will we have an assessment of those kinds of threats? Uh, Georgiana has been in contact with the Army Corps and she is researching uh, Army Corps activities and um, do you have anything else to add, George? We're, we're good. Thank you. The, the, I'd like to ask a question of the utilities. What responsibility do you believe you have? Uh, you know, you're not our enemy. We're not trying to throw you under the bus. But the reality is that, you know, you, we rely upon 
the service that you provide for protecting people's lives. So if you are interrupting that service and it has consequences, what responsibility do you have to help us mitigate those risks in those areas? For example, fire hydrants not working or, or comm systems, whatever it might be. Sure, first and foremost, it would be communication and notification uh, to the extent we can. And it, it, the, the chief, as he was outlining the plan, you know, it, it contemplates a very neat and orderly, there's a 72 hour notification, a 48 hour notification and a 24. Um, I, I don't wanna mislead you up here. That's when we're able to do that. Uh, if we're not able to do that, you may, you, know, you may not get that notification. Uh, that's what the plan is, and to the extent that we're capable of doing that, and who holds us accountable after the fact uh, is the Public Utility Commission um, in reports that we're required to file. Uh, so communication and coordination first and foremost, and you know we did actually have uh, situations like the Chief had described uh, during the Woolsey fire where there was a water agency that lost uh, power. They weren't proactively de-energized, uh, but they lost power due to the fire, and we were able to provide them generators uh, to support fire suppression. So it's, it's, it's not a promise I can make up here that we'll always be able to provide generators because we have a 50,000 square mile service territory, but if it was an, if it was an incident that was limited in scope, uh, we're gonna do absolutely everything we can possibly do uh, to, support the, to support the operation. And I think we've demonstrated that in the past uh, during the Erskine fire. The gentleman that the chief mentioned, Troy Whitman, works for me. He's got two other cohorts that go out and embed directly uh, in the incident command on scene uh, f for the fire operation so that we're able to, to directly support. And that's whether it's a, a hospital, even though they're required to have generators. If a hospital calls us and says, our, our generator didn't start, or a water agency calls us and says, we need help, and you know, the chief or, or you know, the director of emergency management says that this is a critical need, we're gonna do everything that we can possibly do uh, to help. I'm not being ominous with you, but others will judge after a horrific event occurs whether or not you did everything you could do, and the hindsight is a lot more a higher level of scrutiny than, than foresight because people will pick apart your decisions and the chief's decisions and our decisions. So I, I guess that's the... And, and I'm right there with you. Yeah. People pick apart mine as well. And when right. I say we'll, we'll do everything that we can absolutely do, uh, you know, we have incident management teams that are, that are managing these uh, incidents for Southern California Edison. And it's the same protocol and system that's used by the public sector. So, you know, to get in touch with us uh, or how we organize and how we uh, move logistically, how we move uh, equipment is it's very, much, it's very much the same. So that, that also speeds uh, the coordination. Well, I, I hope we can have a series of conversations and updates about how we're coordinating these threats and what role the utilities can play in helping with them. Uh, it, it goes beyond the big public ones my father lived the last 12 years of his life on an air mattress as a quadriplegic from a car wreck that he was in. And uh, his, his life was affected in 20 minutes if that air mattress went down, um, you know, deflated. So having the ability to be aware of the consequences in people's lives and, and plan for them is, uh, you know, we're, we're gonna hold everybody to a high standard to make sure we can do that. So. I look forward to having more conversations so, with you So guys. we're also responsible for public outreach to uh, people with access and functional needs, uh, like you just mentioned, right. um, and partnering up with uh, the local agencies to go and do outreach so that this isn't a surprise to anybody. Yeah, having the generator in the family. There, there are many levels of, of how to get the word down to you know, a 75-year-old woman who's gonna have to go in the backyard and turn on a... Right. Uh, generator because her husband will suffer a half an hour later if there's no power. So there, this is a very, very uh, deep and comprehensive issue. So I'll look forward to having more conversations with you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Supervisor Scribner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chief, I've, I've got a question for you. Um, obviously, if one of these um, PSPs is actually activated, um, 
there's impacts to our fire stations that may be in that particular service area. You, you spoke about um, the ability to fuel the equipment and also operate the, the gate, um, the impacts potentially to the communication system. Um, and then if, you're, if the service area actually has a fire, we talked about the impacts on um, the um, fire hydrants and water supply. But what, if, what about just simply the impacts to our department when we are notified that a PSP may be activated. This has been occurring, I think, every day this week. Um, you first contacted me about this, I think, on Wednesday or Thursday, that potentially this could happen, I think, over the weekend in Bear Valley, where, um, where I have a lot of constituents. So what are the impacts to us when, we just, when we're just notified that this could occur? There's, there's huge impacts, uh, Supervisor Scribner, to uh, not only the fire department, but all of county government, because we all play a role in this. And so every day, um, we get the email notifications, uh, or at least we have been, uh, for over a week now of um, what we do is we ramp up. So, um, you know, we're getting the, we're sending the emails out. Each department head is thinking about um, the area that could be impacted what we can do to help and so um, it's taking away from our daytime operations in other areas to focus on these specific areas uh, for me, we may be thinking about uh, moving a portable generator to another location. We may think about um, you know, how we would operate in that particular area, reaching out to constituents, our public affairs division, um, rapidly uh, working to uh, control rumors or uh, to get the facts straight on a daily basis. And so really everybody is focusing in on their particular function and how it would affect that area and um, taking away from other operations that um, may be important. Do you think there are financial impacts for your department? Yes, most definitely. Um, you know, whenever we, we open the EOC, there is a financial impact to the county. There's a financial impact to probably all the departments within the county. And I can speak for uh, the fire service because um, it is a big deal, um, as uh, Supervisor Maggard alluded to, and all the effects that it could have um, to the old and the young. And we have to prepare for that. It's not something that... Uh, you can take lightly or that um, takes you know few actions it takes uh, quite a bit of um, preparation and to handle something like this um, thank you chief uh, mr. Alsop, um, what's your what's your opinion on um, on potential financial impacts to the county potential or actual financial impacts to the county when we're notified that um, that a PSP as may be activated um, and do you think that we could quantify that? Yeah, I, I'm unable, uh, Chairman Couch, Supervisor Scribner, able to quantify it now. Of course. But, I, but I, in a, I'm in agreement with the Chief. I mean, every, I think the real big concern on this, and I think there's probably a learning curve here for, for everybody, the utilities and local government as this thing rolls out. By the way, Supervisor Couch, just before I answer that, it's, um, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, SB, 901 uh, was a uh, state uh, wildfire law in 2018. The legislature passed that bill, and that required um, utilities to create plans to mitigate these dangers in high fire risk areas. They set forward on creating these plans, and they presented the plans, each individual utility investor owned to the CPUC, who then, I believe that was in March or in the spring, of um, this year, and the CPUC approved or uh, didn't approve those plans. I think in the case, the cases of both these utilities, uh, all those all those plans have been approved. So that is the legislative action. Uh, our big concern, uh, to the chief's point, is uh, you know these power outages are potentially uh, prolonged outages. And which is why we're spending so much time getting prepared and alerting customers and figuring out logistics and things like that. Um, there's gonna be a cost uh, of, uh, associated with uh, preparing and obviously a cost associated when all of this happens, it really all falls on our shoulders 
in unincorporated areas because we've got employees working overtime. Uh, Geo is, uh, you know, she's moved her bedroom into the EOC at this point, I think. Um, but uh, these are concerns. I believe and I think the utilities can, um, can comment directly on this if there is a, uh, a if, if conditions warrant a, a shutoff, and I think it probably depends on the area and the, and the size, um, they uh, institute some sort of a, um, a visual inspection of that entire line. And I believe in conference calls I've listened to, participated in uh, that pro whole process from shutoff to, to, to repowering uh, could be a 24 hour period, if not longer. So that's what we're worried about uh, in areas like Lake Isabella, Bodfish, or Bear Valley uh, in 100 plus degree weather, um, having power off for a 24 hour period or more, uh, that's a substantial undertaking for us to make sure folks are, um, are taken care of. So uh, we would certainly be tracking these costs um, going forward. Yeah, I, I think that we should be. I mean, obviously the big, the big impact um, to the customers for having an outage for an extended period of time is extremely disruptive, can be very problematic for folks that depend on power for keeping medications refrigerated. Um, when it's hot out, um, air conditioning, um, that's gonna be a big deal. But for us, um, just looking at the cost that we are going to have to bear because, this, um, because of this program, I think we need to be quantifying that. We need to be talking to our um, legislative representatives, our lobbyists that we employ um, in order to um, ensure that that we're not that we're bearing the the least financial impact that that we're that we're um, required to um, the you know the the thresholds here twenty five mile per, mile per hour wind or forty five mile per hour gust humidity equal to or less than twenty percent that occurs in parts of my district um, quite frequently. And so my concern is that this, this can be something that we could see implemented um, or rather activated um, with these PSPs um, quite regularly, unfortunately. I mean, I may be wrong about that, but just looking at those thresholds, I think that um, those can occur, occur quite a bit up in the east side of the county um, during certain kinds of parts of uh, certain times of the year. I, I was happy to hear um, that uh, SCE indicated that they have a five-year plan for some infrastructure improvements that are hopefully going to shore up your your um, your grid where these where these occurrences would would be less. Does PG&E also have that kind of a plan? Kristen, could you, Ms. Dow, could you tell us what do you also have a five-year plan or? Yes, we also have a plan, um, and it also includes. Um, hardening our system to ensure that we're util utilizing all the, the latest technology um, to ensure that we're using materials that are more fire resistant, um, that we're, we're also standing up a community wildfire center that monitors all of our um, service territory and we have weather stations as well as um, different monitoring systems that can tell what's going on in real time on the ground. Um, and we have, just as Edison does, we have staff that are doing that as well. Um, that are in person, so. Okay, thank you. That's all for me for right now, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Gleason. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Tom, can I talk to you again? Um, I want to apologize. I really wouldn't do what I said I was going to do when we talked last. I was going to bring an umbrella. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. If there was a bucket over my head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, is that your boss behind you? Uh, no. Oh, he's not. No. Well, tell your boss you're a good man. Okay. You, you took the abuse and you did well and you were calm and I wasn't and uh, somehow we managed our way through the conversation. I want to start off by saying, uh, Tom, and, and this also goes to you, Kristen, is that I applaud um, your efforts. There's no doubt the intent uh, behind what we're trying to do here is to prevent another Erskine fire. That's how I look at that. Uh, we're trying to take every precaution we can to uh, do what we need to do to make sure that we preserve life and to uh, maintain a, the uh, a quality community up there. I also think that part of the reason for this is liability on the utility companies. You're doing it not only because CPUC, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, 
not, uh, uh, not only is because you, you CPU, CPUC has ordained this program and said go forth and do good stuff, but also um, you were sued. Were you sued last year for the for the fire up and um, uh, was that your I'm, was that I'm, you? I'm not the but, I'm not but, the legal representative right. for SE, so I. I it's, it's I, I, the way I read it, and I'm not holding it. I'm not saying this is the wrong thing. I'm just saying that there's a liability to your company, the existence of your companies, because of the problems you had in previous years on fires and local. It's just an assumption I'm making. That is that is a true fact. Okay. Um, so I and I understand that's a, that's a good thing to do. I just think that right now we're in a place where um, uh, removing that liability and preserve and taking these actions are being burdened by the ratepayers and uh, their quality of life and not by making investments sufficiently to prevent it from ever happening again by hardening your systems. I think I'm glad to hear conversations earlier that this is a temporary program. I'm a, I use the word temporary. I, I think it's going to reduce the likelihood very significantly. I couldn't quote you a number at this point, but I think I could commit to you it would be a very significant uh, reduction in the likelihood of ever doing this again because of the hardening and the technology improvements right. you guys are investing in. And I read a report or something where you guys are making $4 billion a year in technology investments. Is that true? Is that it? Not I, locally here, but I couldn't, throughout the I whole couldn't state? Quote that, I couldn't quote that it was $4 billion, uh, I I but I know, I know we're spending hundreds of millions in uh, hardening. Hardening our electric system. I, I'm trying to stick up for you, Tom. I'm investing, trying to help you out here. Investing, our, investing in our ability to uh, forecast the weather and see what right. and see what it's actually doing out there, so that we can make decisions. It's a lot of money. I, I, I appreciate that. The uh, PS PS program was began. I know you guys have had the authority and the capability of de-energizing circuits for years. You did it in 2003. You said, but when did the PS PS program begin? Uh, I think it was in uh, 2018. Is when we really had a formalized. Uh, a more formalized plan. Okay, so last year we had the PSPS program. Right. Not to say that you didn't have the ability to take precautionary actions previous to that, but the program began last we, year. We have the authority to operate our grid safely. Thank you, appreciate it. How many times have you, you I heard you say there are three lines that have been de-energized, totally were, impacting 148 customers? There were, that's, that's, Correct. There were three de-energization events. There may have been more than three lines involved, but it, it could have been three. Thanks. I appreciate it. Um, the, the conversation we had, um, I don't know when it was. I have no idea what day That's it was. That's okay. I don't remember either. It all runs but, together. But it was about tripping off the Erskine circuit, and that would have impacted 3,097 people. 3,082. 3,082 people. Okay. Uh, that is a significantly, uh, uh, that, that's a significant event to the quality of life of those people. And the, the intent is to, in, in your mind and, and how we're going about this is that would be better than, you know, it's bad, but it's better than the Erskine fire happening again. Right. And that would initiate the, the action. And so there, ergo was our conversation. And um, you talked a little bit, I got a bunch of questions, I'm spraying all over the place because I'm writing them down as we're talking, so don't mind me if this uh, doesn't, doesn't have flow flow to it. The thresholds for you making the decision, or tell me about who the people are that make the decision to trip the circuit off. So we have an incident commander that's back at our emergency operations center that makes the final call. And who is he? He is... Uh, Not his name, but what is his qualifications? Um, experience working in our transmission distribution group, operational experience. Is he a former fire person? No, fire electric, safety? electric Electric, electrical per, engineer. electric people. Okay. Okay. So tell me about the process. When you get get, get ready to throw that switch, what is going to happen to get you to the, to make that decision, or that person make that decision? We either see see the conditions coming into fruition because we have weather stations out there as well, um, or we get reports in from our observers in the field that say, "Hey, we're seeing unsafe conditions out here. We're either seeing the lines dancing." Uh, up and up and down, which can cause sparks, or we're seeing hearing tree branches break or palm fronds blowing through the air. Uh, our operations people will take that information directly to our incident commander, and they'll make the decision to de-energize. Now, in the time leading up to it, we'll also be looking at what are the isolation points 
so that while initially we may have to drop all 3,082 customers, very soon after that, an hour afterwards, we're able to, through switching, isolate that down to just the area where the unsafe conditions were observed. That's why in the last three events, you know, there were many more customers than 148 grand total that could have been impacted, could have been thousands, uh, five to 7,000, but we were able to pinch down the outages through those isolation points in our circuits, if that makes sense. Uh, yes, yeah, it does. Um, what, what, how, what collaboration do you do with our fire chief, who's our professional, our go-to guy for fire management in the Kern River Valley? What decision, you're, you're making a decision, is that decision independent of his input? Yes. So I was hearing, I got in the same phone call with you or maybe someone previous to that, that um, this decision was being um, on the table, being put on the table. This is where I was being notified. You were going through your notification yep. chain. I was being notified by somebody. And I was being told by a fire chief that it is a normal, sunny, windy day in the Kern River Valley, and yet we're getting ready to throw the switch and evacuate 3,082 people from their homes and bring them down to the, to the uh, Lake Isabella Senior Center, which I don't even know if there was another event going on or not. So you can imagine in my mind what I'm thinking. I'm saying, why, why, why are these people who are independent of Kern County making a decision that's going impact, to impact my constituents and not take the counsel from my fire guy, who is the pro from Dover on managing fires in the Kern River Valley? So my question is, you see that, that did, I asked you in our conversation, I said, please, before you ever throw that switch, talk to him. Did that occur, or do you think that change needs to be made so that he has input into your decision? So or does that reduce the so, liability? So, or so in, the, so in the in the days leading up, so the 72 hours, the 48 hours, I, I heard the chief loud and clear when we spoke, before I spoke with you, uh, that he thought it was a normal day that he thought it was a regular day, he didn't see an extreme risk. Uh, I explained that we were seeing an elevated risk. Uh, and I think, so there, is, so there is the input that's coming in. It's in our incident objectives to consider input uh, from the public sector. So it, it would be fair to say that it was considered. Um, I think there's an opportunity for all the utilities and the fire agencies to, to, or for us to get on the same page as them. Uh, I had a meeting with Tom Porter, for Chief director of CAL FIRE just yesterday, uh, where he has asked uh, for that to happen in short order, because this isn't the only place uh, where we could have that discontinuity. Did the Kern Valley Hospital, was that impacted by, if you threw the Erskine switch? I didn't even ask that. I don't recall off the top of my head. That would have triggered a, 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 a about a thousand more decisions that we'd have to make downstream of that decision that would adversely impact the quality of life of those patients that were in that hospital or the patients who had scheduled visits that time. So what I'm, I'm seeing in my mind here on this whole deal is I see the quality of life of the people in the Kernville, Kern River Valley being significantly adversely impacted by a decision that's going to be made by a group of people I don't even know. And because you're going to be shutting off in the summer, it's probably going to happen most in the summertime when their business occurs. You're going to be shutting down electrical power to businesses, to hospitals, to restaurants, to uh, a whole bunch of people. And if the thresholds that you maintain are steady throughout the time you make them, and the same people are making the same subjective decisions or objective decisions, then who's going to want to do business in the Kern River Valley? Who's going to want to come up there if you guys are saying it's time to throw the switch because we got 25 knots of breeze and the fire chief is saying, hey, it's a normal sunny day up here. So where's, how, does, how, does that, how does that balance, how do we achieve that balance between the decision that's going to be made by, mandated by the CPUC to you guys and the state legislature to the uh, safety of the people in the Kern River Valley and the quality of life and their quality of business? How do, we, how do we go? Who do I need to talk to? I, I just don't agree so, with the way this program is. I don't agree with it. I, I think it's a bad, I don't think it's bad. I think it's a good program, but I think it's got to change quickly because I don't think it can, can sustain itself after we have one, two, or three of these events. Uh, oh, oh, holy, you know what's going to break out. Well the, well, the chief still has the opportunity to tell us that he doesn't think he sees a threat. Um, but we don't have to act on 
exactly what he says. So, so he can, he's giving input to the process. We, st we still may make a decision to, to go ahead and do something else. So he doesn't, he doesn't have final say. Right. So he has input to the process. He gave his input. Um, he gave his input during the process. Um, so the process accounts for that because we, we had a call. Um, you know, the, the coordination and the support that we've gotten from uh, Georgiana and, and her organization has been great. So I'm not trying to paint the line, uh, but you do have a voice. Right. There is a voice in the process. Thank you, Tom. Uh, uh, the, is, is, the, is the person throwing the switch for SC and e, SCE the same person who throws a switch for PG&E, or are they two different people? Two different people. So they could come up with two different conclusions. One could throw the switch and one could not. That's, that's true. OK, thank you. But that's also part of what Tom Porter is trying to get trying to get us all on the same page. So right. that we're looking at the same, working off the same sheet of music. Before we shut secure power to uh, a business, to, to, to um, uh, the supermarket up there, any of the, we have to come to, to a final answer on what's in the, how, how to do this better, in my opinion. I, I just don't like the program. I'm glad to hear you say it's temporary. I'm glad to hear you say that there's five years, that you're hopeful to be, your, your company's target is five years to get hardened to the point where you don't have to do this. I appreciate that. I wish you'd make it three years or two years, but that'd be good. Um, you also said in your comment, I think you said, maybe you didn't say, but I saw on the map that Bakersfield is not tier two or tier three. Is that a correct statement? I, I don't think I said that. I think uh, PG&E's Bakersfield. Okay. Is that true, Kristen, that Bakersfield is not in tier two or tier three? Correct. Does that, can I assume from that statement that Bakersfield, because they're not in tier two or tier three, would never be impacted by any decision that these people make in this, in this room someplace on a switch? No, unfortunately, all of our service territory needs to be prepared for a power shutoff. What does that mean? It is less likely because it is not in a tier two or tier three, but we do need to be prepared because one of the reasons that PG&E actually did not come to the county last year is because our service territory um, within Kern County did not include um, any tier two or tier three areas that included transmission lines, or excuse me, distribution lines. So last year, our program just included distribution lines. So those are the smaller circuits that, and lines that, that serve smaller regional areas. Transmission lines, which we have many transmission lines which run through Kern County, um, are the larger lines that serve much larger customers and larger areas. And so the reason that this program now affects Kern County in terms of PG&E um, is because this year transmission lines are included. Kristen, if the gentleman in, or the lady in the room that was going to throw this switch someplace to mm -hmm. turn, turn de-energize the Erskine circuit, would that have impacted people in Bakersfield? So the Erskine circuit is Edison's circuit, right? And PG&E does not provide service in that area. Okay. So PG, so no, it would not because PG&E's lines are are in Bakersfield. Now, obviously the grid all is interconnected, right? Um, but in terms of PG&E, that would not have triggered a PSPS PG&E event. Thank you, Kristen. Tom, can mm -hmm. I talk to you? Can I ask you the same question? People in Bakersfield would they be impacted if your professional electrical engineer through that switch to, to de-energize the Erskine circuit? Truth is, I don't know standing here. Okay. Uh, I, I, what I would ask is that maybe I could come back uh, to this group with a formal, more formal presentation to describe the whole program. Okay, if, we'll, if you we'll would find about, that useful. But, but we could talk about that in but, a minute. But with transmission, uh, which we, you know, all the investor-owned utilities have to consider transmission. We were ordered uh, to consider that. Transmission is m far more impactful. Uh, I could tell you w we don't treat transmission the same way we do distribution. The way we would treat, if we saw significant, what we thought would to be significant risks on the transmission line, this is probably going too deep. Uh, there's a California independent system operator which is like the air traffic controller for the electric grid in California, three days out, we would call them and, and schedule an outage on the particular line. Uh, that way, the power, they have time to plan, and the power could be rerouted. Uh, we wouldn't just 
shut it off, um, you know, unless. So it's, it's like a train line. You shut off one thing here, but you route the train the other way. Transmission electric. is very impactful. Okay, all right. Well. Very impactful. Um, let me ask you just an arbitrary question. I see the chief inching close to the mic. He wants to say something here. Go ahead, chief. I was just going to add to that, sir, that I, I think there is uh, con some concern on my end that the, through the transmission lines, maybe going to L.A. County to abate a threat there would have impact here. Um, I'm not an electrical expert, but I am concerned about that. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Tom, um, how close were we to throwing the Erskine switch over the weekend? I don't know how close, uh, how to characterize it. We were, we were close to our wind speeds that we had identified, very close, uh, but we didn't see any threats out in the field. Uh, our eyes back from the field said that they did not see uh, unsafe conditions. So the progression in making the decision that would have shut down security to power 3,000 people uh, isn't, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, and I'm, I know I'm not trying to wordsmith this thing, but you don't have a clear idea of how close you were to making that decision? Well, I would say we were not close because the feedback that we got from our field observers who were out there, you know, an hour before they're expecting the wind uh, to hit or these conditions to manifest, and they're there for an hour afterwards just as a buffer, uh, their reports back to us were they were not seeing unsafe conditions. They were seeing the wind come up like we forecast it would, uh, but they were not seeing unsafe conditions. Okay, so... So we were not close to shutting the, to okay, shutting the power fair off. Fair enough. Tom, in one of the briefs I have here, it says that the PSPS program decision is based on weather, on weather conditions. This brief we showed earlier today, it says, utilities preemptively deactivated power lines due to significant threat of wildfire, and it's based on weather conditions. So uh, that, that doesn't say, and you're clearing it up for me, which you're seeing telephone poles swaying and stuff like that, which is not necessarily a weather condition. It's a, something that happened. Well, it's wind. No, it's telephone pole moving. Wind is a causal effect to it. So what you're, you, you're making the decision that you, uh, based on 25 knots of wind, well, you could have 25 knots of wind from 220, or you could have 25 knots from 180, and have a completely different effect on the telephone pole swaying. Absolutely. So. So it's not weather conditions. It's going to be a combination of weather conditions and... And how they're, how they're actually manifesting the safety conditions out on the field. Okay, there's, there's a lot of variables that I'm, I'm not real clear on, but I'm hoping it'll get more clear in the ensuing days. Uh, could, could, could you tell me when, our, when in the progression of making the decision do you trigger, or I don't know, maybe you, this isn't a question for you, the, the EOC stands up? When does the EOC, we get 72 hours, you notify government, 48 hours, you start notifying more people, and then 24 hours, and it marches on till you get to a decision to throw the switch. When does our EOC stand up? When does your EOC stand yes. up? Who, who would answer that question? And so as we get closer, and um, we'll be monitoring the situation, we haven't done it yet. We haven't had a. Did the EOC uh, stand up last weekend? No, we did. Uh, we have a very limited, uh, as uh, CAO alluded to, Georgiana is uh, spending some long days in the EOC. However, we didn't stand up uh, a full EOC operation. Uh, as we lose power, we will stand up uh, a full EOC operation to make sure we address issues. Thanks, Chief. I, um, uh, Supervisor Scrivener talked about costs, and uh, so I won't beat that drum, but that's another issue that I have uh, to, I'm trying to understand how much it's going to cost us for this person to make a decision and how that's going to impact us and our budget and, oh boy. Outreach. What guarantees, I, let's say, let's say I, I some people in Bodfish that I know very well that don't answer their phones, but uh, the lady is suffering from Alzheimer's later stages, the gentleman is an older gentleman. What guarantees do I have that they would have been notified. I mean, how, how do you go about outreach? How do you manage outreach and how do you guarantee that sure. the people most in need not only get notified that their power's going out, but also have the transportation available to get them to Lake Isabella City Senior Center? And how do we know Lake Isabella Senior Center is gonna be capable of managing their particular circumstances? So to try to take those one at a time, uh, what our program calls for or what our actual practices are um, 
or to, to notify people via their method of preference. Okay, so if we have somebody that has, uh, that, that would be like an access and functional needs type person like you were maybe describing, uh, we have programs called critical care, uh, critical care program where people that are maybe medically dependent on power um, and have low tolerances for, for outages. So we notify them via our normal notification system. It's either by phone or by text or by email or all three, however they want to be notified. Uh, our customer service system that does that messaging is smart enough to know whether it got, I don't want to say an answering machine because nobody has those anymore, but whether it got a voicemail or whether a human being picked up. Uh, if we don't get a positive response on that outbound notification, meaning, okay, yeah, it went to a voicemail, uh, a human being at Edison will call the customer uh, on the cust customer's phone record that we have. Uh, if that fails, we will send, uh, and we did this just last weekend, we will send an employee out to the customer's home to knock on the door and make sure that they're aware uh, that we may, we may de-energize the line. Um, we're also required to be doing outreach uh, to these communities, to vulnerable populations um, across the across our territory, and we've done we've we did that last year. We're going to be doing more of it this year. So, is it a guarantee? No, but I think you know we're, we're I think we're taking steps to do the right thing. And then on top of that, uh, at this meeting we had with Cal OES yesterday, it's been uh, a difficult prospect to share. Uh, information that we have on our critical care customers with the public sector, with um, you know your county folks here, uh, Cal OES or others, uh, because of certain laws and regulations. So the PUC, uh, we asked them uh, yesterday, and they agreed to direct us uh, to share this information, information on you know where are the hospitals that we support, where are those. Uh, other critical infrastructure uh, so that we can share that information uh, more freely than uh, well, we actually weren't able to share it at all. Uh, we were prevented by regulation. So I think we uh, have short-circuited um, the process there and we were able to do that much more quickly. Thank you, Tom. Hey, Chief, can I ask you a question? Uh, was the Sheriff's Department notified? I imagine I remember the EOC. They yes, do all they're a, a member of the EOC and a very active member. So it's safe for me to assume that if we did pull a trigger and evacuate all those homes, we would surge our sheriff's departments up there to make sure we manage law enforcement. We didn't have all these thieves running around, all that kind of stuff. They would definitely be involved. And, and I want to make sure, I want to reiterate, we wouldn't evacuate the whole area. Um, we would just assist within that area. Okay. Um, I, I, I thank everybody for your patience on this. Uh, Tom, I think we have some work, Kristen, I think we have some work to do. I really do. I would like to help. I would like to be part of the solution. I would like to get something moving because I recognize the effort we're trying to make. If I need to go up to talk to CPUC, I'd be glad to do that, work with locally with you guys. I don't think this program is, is clearly laid out. It's, it's just not flat on the table yet. And I think we need to get it there fast before we evacuate one home or an elderly person or we shut down one business or we turn power off to a hospital. We need to get all our ducks in a row, and right now, I just don't think we're there. So I'm eager to work with you. Please call, call my staff, and I will uh, take that on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgences. Thank you, Supervisor. Good job. Um, I have a couple of brief ones, and then we're going to, I don't want to keep you here any longer than I need to, but is there, what would you suggest to your customers or PG&E's customers that they do to mitigate this to them, to, their, to the extent, the greatest extent possible? Is it solar panels? Is it having... Uh, a generator in their home? What are the types of things they should do? So generator, uh, water, um, flashlights, these types of, these types of things that, that they should have in general, whether it's a proactive power shutoff or earthquake preparedness. But specifically to power, it's a generator? A generator is great to have. Not everybody can afford one of those. If they have solar panels, will that no. mitigate it? If they have batteries in their home, uh, we get this question quite a bit. People think, if I have solar panels on my home, I'm going to be immune to power outages. And unless you have a storage 
capacity on your on your property unless you have batteries you're you're going to go down okay that's an important point um you all are making decision is there any information that's publicly available that the public could access to to even get a head start or get a, a jump on the fact that this might occur well we're going to be required uh to publish uh, it's in the, the rulemaking that the Public Utility Commission put out. We're going to be required to publish these thresholds uh, for that exact reason so that, you know, it's not a game of Marco Polo trying to figure out where, when is PG&E going to be considering it, when is SCE going to be considering it. So pretty shortly here, we're going to be publishing, you know, what those thresholds are and communicating that. So that, that'll be a different ball game at that point than it is today because today nobody knows. Right. At that point, if they want to follow those conditions, yep. they can see that. Okay. Um, there's no minimum amount of time that, that the power could be shut off. Or excuse me, maximum amount of time. Depending on conditions, it could go on and on and on. Yeah, the maximum amount of time. I, I couldn't quote you a time. It's, it's like asking me to be able to predict what the, right. what the weather outcome right. is going to do. Is there a minimum? that people could expect. If it's going to get it's shut different, down, it's, it's going to be... It's different for different circuits. What I could tell you is I can only go back to the last three events that we had, which I don't want to mislead this group. That may not be indicative of what they're going to be in the, in the future, but the last ones, we didn't have anybody off longer than 24 hours. Okay. In fact, most were, were on before the 24-hour mark. Are customers incurring any cost during the time that the power is shut off? Uh, I have not been advised that they are, but... I would expect that they are experiencing some cost, you know, in which case they would file a claim uh, with us just like they would do for, for other outages. You need to give your, your claims people some uh, pats on the back, and especially the people that have to go out and knock on the doors and say, by the way, your power is going to get shut off. Right. Thank you for being here today. Okay. Tough job. Thank you. Any other, any other questions by the board? Seeing none, we just need a motion to receive and file. I'm sorry, is there any public comment on this item? Thought we had that. Yes, sir. Yes, as part of my think tank, um, I actually create um, drones as well as um, a, a, a water saving and, and fire protection and solving problems. Um, and the drone will actually have, will have water built into the drone and will go over to those remote areas and drop large Mal water on those wildfires in the in those areas. So I was hoping me and you guys could actually be um, supportive with me and me being supportive with you, so we could solve those problems in that remote areas. Thank you, Mr. Horn. Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Current Tax has been participating in numerous uh, coalitions to address this issue of reliability and resiliency in the system. The biggest problem California has is they refuse to protect the right-of-ways. Our forests have grown overgrown, our transmission lines, we've seen pictures, trees are, you know, bend, leaves connect, they arc, things happen. We've all seen pictures in the Northwest where the right-of-ways of the utility towers are kept perfectly clean so there's no trees overgrowing them and causing the problem. They also manage their forests, which we don't do in California. So this is a post-problem reaction that they have to go through that affects every consumer. If we protected our assets properly by maintaining right-of-ways as just one example, which the state refuses to do, we wouldn't be having these discussions now. So if you're gonna to go to the PUC, who only follows what state law is, we have to get back to the idea of protecting right-of-ways, managing our forests, since most of the transmission lines do run through forests, and that's where you have your biggest fires. It's kind of common sense, 
and I can make these comments on this subject because we're intervening at the PUC in a general rate case, but this isn't a general rate case situation. This affects all the public utilities, but only the public utilities, not the municipal utilities, which is kind of another question because they all use the grid. Thank you. Thank you. How much of these files are actually considered arson? Do any of you guys know that? Mr. Horn. Good morning. I'm Dennis Fox. Um, one of the things I would happen to me, and that is uh, air. Um, I have need a concentrator, a nebulizers, and other I'm not, and uh, I'm not the only one in that situation. One of the ways to get around it is to get, and it's very inexpensive, about 20 bucks or so, get a little nebulizer. And um, you can get them, the um, rectifiers, they go from 12 volt to uh, 110, and you can put them on your car. I think that's something they ought to fly or they ought to put in the, for emergency uses. And it, um, it does work. Of course, I'm, I got the hook up the car, now I'm stuck, I have to keep the car, because it's the only thing you can keep. So there is a downside to it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Any other public comments? That will go to the board. Just need a motion to receive and file. I'm sorry. Mr. Alsip, did you punch in? I'm okay. County Council, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Couch. I wanted to follow up on your earlier question, and I'm not sure that uh, we found all the information, but you asked for some kind of the legal background or why, uh, what, what brought the uh, PSPS to us. And from what I can tell, <clears throat> The California Public Utility Code in 1997 and 2000 uh, enacted both sections 451 and 399.2, which give electric companies the authority to operate in a safe, reliable, efficient, and uh, cost-efficient manner, which has been interpreted to allow for power shutoffs or power shutdowns. And then um, it seems that in roughly 2008, from what I can tell, there was kind of the first time that the de-energy de-energization um, happened in, through San Diego. Um, through the years, it was expanded. It included PG&E and Southern California Edison. Um, as a result of the, the number of large wildfire fires in 2017, the Public Utility Commission um, in July of 2018 issued resolution ESRB number eight, which is the formalization of the de-energization, the PS, PSPS that kind of gets us to where we are right now. Um, it formula, formalized the, the plan, it created policies, regulations, including notifications and communications and the various things that have been explained to you um, today. Um, with the, it sets the how the decision is made, when it can be made, the notification requirements. And then following that, in July of 18, there was a series of other legislation, one of which was uh, referenced earlier by Mr. Alsop, Senate Bill 901, which was in August of 2018. And that provided money for fire prevention, um, including things such as forest thinning. Um, it did make some changes to how the utilities um, can, um, manage a liability around wildfires, such as issuing bonds and um, passing costs on to ratepayers. There were other uh, legislati legislative actions that um, what we just found, one Senate Bill 2279, where there may be some grants available that would provide for uh, uh, reimbursement or grant money if, when there are, is a de-energization uh, episode to recover some cost, so we'll look into to that. But that's the um, legal kind of historical perspective of how we got to today's PSPS. Thank you. Board, 
Motion to receive and file. Thank you. We have a motion, but no second. Second. Please cast your votes. Oh, excuse me. Mr. Maggard, I know you voted yes on that. So I will let the record reflect that the vote is 